Hey guys! How are y'all? This video is going to be a mix of me doing this to my face and reading my mid-semester essay of Is Alaska in Looking for Alaska by John Green, A Manic Pixie Dream Girl. That's not the title of the essay, but that's what the theme of the essay is. Ignore my bed. I'm washing my sheets. Please don't look at my mattress. Don't. Okay, so let's get started with the video. I hope y'all have a great time. And I know this looks like a lot. It is a lot. And I know I didn't do the best job, but you know what? I'm sorry. So I'm gonna do a combination video where I do my makeup and then read my essay while I'm doing my makeup. So that's probably- this is probably a terrible idea. It might be a little all over the place. I'm not sure yet. I just had this idea. I just wanted to sit down and do my makeup. We're just gonna go in with some clippies, you know? Always gotta separate these bangs. Okay, I'm gonna start with some primer and I guess let's start reading my essay as well. I'll read it while I'm putting this on my face. <laughs> I think this might be an excessive amount of primer. Okay, my essay is titled The Manic Pixie Dream Girl, Criticisms of John Green and his novel Looking for Alaska. I'm embarrassed to read the first paragraph. I have no idea how I'm gonna get through this entire video. There she sits, a cigarette in one hand, a book in the other. She smokes to die and drinks to drown out her mysterious, never-ending despair. She is the muse of the scrawny, great perhaps seeking Miles Pudge Halter, the protagonist and narrator of John Green's novel Looking for Alaska. She is Alaska Young, and to many, she is the epitome of the notorious Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I'm gonna let that sit for a second. The term Manic Pixie Dream Girl was created in 2007 by the critic Nathan Rabin, a term he coined specifically to describe Kristen Dunst's character in the Cameron Crowe film Elizabethtown. She plays a character that alters the life of the suicidal protagonist played by Orlando Bloom. Rabin defines the Manic Pixie Dream Girl as a character who exists solely in the fevered imaginations of sensitive writer-directors to teach broodingly soulful young men to embrace life and its infinite mysteries and adventures. Now I'm going to go in with a concealer stick. With no real depth of her own, she exists only to have her quirkiness and flaws romanticized, while simultaneously being impossible to obtain and furthering the male protagonist's personal development. Although the term was created mainly for characters in film, it has since crossed the literary threshold and has further seeped into popular culture. Women with a likable personality and colorful hair are more and more frequently referred to as a potential manic pixie dream girl. In turn, the trope has become overused and misused. John Green's criticisms primarily come from online blog posts and columns, usually stating something along the lines of how Green exploits the manic pixie's appeal to the utmost. Green has rebutted this claim by stating he created his character specifically to combat the trope. Alaska is a static, rounded character with a dynamic past. The reader has to pick up on the details Green leaves throughout the novel, and although that may be difficult for some, that does not mean they are not there. Her existence does not serve to cater to the narrator Miles, he just wants to think it does. And while he does periodically view Alaska in a misogynistic light due to him being an average teenage boy, there are times when he does not. There are times when he sees her for the person she is, and there are times when he realizes that he will never know her completely because the real Alaska is not a trope. Real quick, I'm just gonna go in with some powder under my eyes. I, I don't know what I'm doing when I do my makeup ever. It's just all nonsense. Before I go on, I am gonna use concealer on top of my eyes. I don't have an eye primer yet. Please don't come for me, Robert Welsh, please. I'm sorry. That's too much. That's far too much. Whoops. So we ended with because the real Alaska is not a trope. The use of the trope itself is seen as misogynistic because manic pixie dream girls, and therefore according to some Green's characters, are one-dimensional due to the nature of them solely existing to develop the male protagonist's character arc. It is also mentioned by critics that Miles defaults to the misogynistic treatment of Alaska while still earnestly dropping hints that he wants to understand her as a person. Although, it seems apparent that Green intentionally uses Miles' misogynistic view of Alaska to give her the appearance of a manic pixie dream girl, while there are then many details throughout the novel that fill out her character. Even though those details are surrounded by Miles' infatuation of Alaska, as he refers to her as the hottest girl in all of human history, the details of Alaska as a human being are still there for the reader to pick up on. She has interests, she has emotions, she has a past that affects her, and she has effects on the people around her who do not view her through the same romanticized lens as the narrator. Yeah. I'm gonna take some some cheese dust. 
and slap that on my eye. Some specific details that fill out Alaska's character are her hobbies and aspirations, something critics claim she lacks. Amongst being extremely sociable with friends and crafting elaborate pranks, Alaska's main hobby is one of the oldest known to mankind, reading. Books fuel her pretentious vocabulary and her life seems to revolve around them. In Miles' second interaction with Alaska, he asks her if she has read all the books in her room, and Alaska replies with, Oh god, no. I've maybe read a third of them, but I'm going to read them all. I call it my life's library. Every summer since I was little, I've gone to garage sales and bought all the books that looked interesting, so I always have something to read. Alaska explains her hobby and splices in a little detail of her life. Her world revolves around books. Her room is filled with them, she quotes them, she uses her favorite book as the topic of an essay for school. Alaska is nothing less than passionate about reading. Further, she intends to put all that reading to use with her goals to teach disabled kids, which she tells Miles in an interaction not too far from the one previously mentioned. I'm gonna mix this mustard color with this like neon yellow color and go around like the edges of the orange. Then next I'm gonna go in with this darker orange color on the outsides. On top of the trope being seen as misogynistic and one-dimensional, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is also associated with mental illness and the romanticization of it. Green is also criticized of this romanticization specifically. Apparently, Miles romanticizes Alaska's trauma and turns it into a quality that adds to her attractiveness. These critics must have missed Miles' reflection on Alaska, where after drinking and playing a game she made up, she reveals how her mother died when Alaska was a child, and how she did nothing to help. She blames her mother's death on herself, and after the rest of her friends chime in and express their distress and not having known this detail, Miles reflects on her story. It was the central moment of Alaska's life. I imagined a scrawny eight-year-old with dirty fingers looking down at her mother convulsing. So she sat down with her dead or maybe not mother, who I imagined was not breathing by then, but wasn't yet cold either. And in the time between dying and death, a little daughter sat with her mother in silence. She must have come to feel so powerless, I thought, that the one thing she might have done, pick up the phone and call an ambulance, never even occurred to her. The trauma of Alaska's past is never romanticized by Miles. It is left to be seen for what it is. Along with this reflection, Miles also points out how this event has shaped Alaska as a person, realizing that she became impulsive, scared by her inaction into perpetual action. I think I'm supposed to have yellow down here too. But I already put some orange there, so I'm gonna fix that real quick. Okay, so yeah, just a little bit, a bunch more yellow, and then, yeah, I look ridiculous. I'm taking pigment, and then I'm gonna blend it down. Miles is accused of romanticizing Alaska's death as well. Miles freezes an idea of her in his mind, allowing him to romanticize the Alaska from his memories, subsequently silencing female identity shaped by trauma and treading on a grave danger of female censorship. After Alaska dies, it is her friends that repeatedly remind the reader and Miles that his imagined version of her was not actually her. The Colonel, a friend of Alaska and Miles, reminds Miles to remember the person she actually was and reminds him to stop caring only about the Alaska he made up. It is only after more romanticization from Miles that the Colonel finally snaps and exposes him for his unrealistic manic pixie dream girl fantasies of Alaska when he yells, All that matters is you and your precious fucking fantasy that you and Alaska had this goddamn secret love affair and she was going to leave Jake for you and you'd live happily ever after. But she kissed a lot of guys, Pudge, and if she were here, we both know that she would still be Jake's girlfriend and that there'd be nothing but drama between the two of you. Not love, not sex, just you pining after her. Damn, Colonel pop off. After Alaska's death, she's accused of being more understandable and less mysterious, of having a larger impact on Miles while in the form of his fantasies in his mind. Alaska Young is accused of being solely a catalyst, of having the crazy factor and the mystery component only for the protagonist's benefit. However, it is apparent throughout the novel and after her death that her erratic mood and mysteriousness impacted more than just the protagonist. Her character did not exist solely for the protagonist's benefit. Okay, before moving on, I'm going in with a big old fluffy brush and some blush, and we're gonna get real crazy. There are so many accusations, and while some of the characteristics of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope ring true for Alaska, it seems as though these critics interpreted the novel differently than others. It is understandable how critics can believe Alaska to represent a Manic Pixie Dream Girl as a physically and otherwise perfect fantasy being, because yes, Miles is in love with an idea of her, but her friends are not. 
They recognize her as a person. When Miles speaks his fantasies of her out loud, they correct him, and readers have details of her life to digest on their own. It is apparent in the novel that Green gives the illusion of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope and then exposes it and its absurdity by revealing the flaws of the protagonist. Yes, she is heavily romanticized through the lens of a teenage boy narrator, but Alaska Young is far from one-dimensional. I just want to say I'm super biased, okay? I love looking for Alaska. I read it in fifth, sixth grade. I'm 23 now, so it's, you know, it's, ha it's held a special place in my heart for my entire life. There is so much about her life in this novel and people are just ignoring it and they're like oh she's one-dimensional and she's only there to serve miles and it's like is she though or do you just want to be angry about something i think this is looking a little more intense than i did it the first time whoops last paragraph putting this label on alaska feels misogynistic in itself Failing to view her as the person she is is reductive of the impact she has on the other characters and on the novel as a whole. Nathan Rabin has reflected on his coined Manic Pixie Dream Girl label and says, I honestly hate the term. I feel deeply weird, if not downright ashamed, at having created a cliche that is nothing more than a representation of a sexist trope or some sad dude's regressive fantasy. Readers and critics should be able to reflect on the information they have been given about a character and recognize that certain characters are not solely as they exist in the narrator's mind. Readers have their own brains that are capable of seeing female characters as the persons they are presented as and not as misogynistic tropes that reduce female characters to one-dimensional love interests. That's it. That's the entire essay. I got a little feisty there at the end. Sorry, professor. Look, I'm not a professional, okay? So I understand that it might not have been the best essay in the world, but I was pretty proud of it when I wrote it. I'm still kind of proud of it, honestly. So that's it for the essay. I'm just gonna be doing my makeup for the rest of the video. If you wanna dip, that's fine. I get it, you just came here for the essay. Sorry, I spliced in so much makeup in between. Also, I would love to know what y'all think about the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope and the women that get called Manic Pixie Dream Girls in literature or film. Cause I just feel like it's so heavily misused. Like who are some other women that are labeled as Manic Pixie Dream Girls that you don't think is a Manic Pixie Dream Girl? I have another one off the top of my head. Summer from 500 Days of Summer. She gets labeled as a Manic Pixie Dream Girl. She's totally not a Manic Pixie Dream Girl. And people argue about John Green saying that he created his novels to combat these stupid tropes that people are putting on women. Um, and they're like, but he failed. He didn't do a good job. How? Look, just because a woman is being romanticized in a novel by the narrator is not synonymous with her being a one-dimensional character that only exists for his gain or purpose or whatever. She can have other stuff going on, and whether you choose to pay attention to that or not is your problem. John Green could write a whole nother novel from Alaska's perspective, and I would eat that shit up. I would eat that. I would eat the book, okay? No, but I would be <laughs> so excited. So, how have y'all been? I hope everybody's okay. Hope y'all are all staying safe. I hope your loved ones are safe. I've been playing a lot of Skyrim. I was playing Call of Duty for a minute, and then I was like, I just wanna relax, you know? I just wanna pick some flowers. Okay, I don't want to keep this video going longer than it needs to, so I'm just gonna finish and then I'll come back and say hi and then say bye. And that'll be it. Okay, um, I think I'm done. I attempted to contour and it turned out bad and I put some concealer here and then powder and then I made my nose a little red and I put, you know, some highlight. And that's it. So this is the completed crazy makeup look. I saw it on TikTok and I did it. And yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know what you thought of my essay. I know it could have been stronger. I know I could have made it better, but it was, it was a limit to six pages, I think. And I got to six pages. And so I was like, okay, this is, this is it. I need to stop. I need to stop. <laughs> so I stopped. Thank y'all for watching. I really appreciate it. We're almost at 200 subscribers. So that's crazy. Uh, thank you all so much for subscribing. I really appreciate it. Um, if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe, you can subscribe. Oh, and this is what it looks like a little bit closer up. Not super well blended. So anyways, goodbye again, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye.